So I ask if people have questions, uh, maybe you raise your virtual hand um, and or, oh, oh good, we got to, uh, and or uh, enter comments in the chat room. So Professor uh, Ramadori is going to kick us off. Oh, uh, Giuliano, I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much for the great talks. Uh, thank you, everybody. We, we really so... Uh, also beautiful pictures, and I want to ask uh, TMU now. Uh, we showed we, you saw that PET is a, is a good uh, technique, diagnostic technique. Do you have data on uh, on uh, PET positive lymph nodes before you before you operate? So I, I don't have data on like the independent value of like PET. Like PET is associated with the worst prognosis. I mean, they're collinear. So if your lymph nodes are positive on PET, then you're usually, you know, you have lymph node metastasis and lymph node metastasis are associated with the worst prognosis, right? So that's my line of, of uh, logic. I don't know if Dr. Kamel can comment on <clears throat> if there's like a false positive um, with regards to like nodal disease on PET. But again, in my practice, if the PET scan lights up with lymph node metastasis, I am more inclined to treat them preoperatively with chemotherapy because I know they will have a worse prognosis. I don't know, Ehab, can you comment? Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, typically we look for suspicious adenopathy, not just by size, but on cross-sectional imaging CT or MR. If the lymph node is more rounded rather than flat, if it loses its fatty hilum, and if it becomes centrally necrotic, with intense enhancement, these are very suspicious features. We typically will get PET, and PET often confirms that there's FDG uptake. If we have any questions and they are accessible to biopsy, we may biopsy these. Uh, but as was mentioned by Dr. Pollock, if the lymph nodes are suspicious and they are PET avid, uh, they are, I, don't see a lot of reactive adenopathy in the setting of cholangiocarcinoma, maybe in the setting of hepatitis and HCC. Oftentimes we see these porta cable lymph nodes that are reactive, but significantly less likely in the setting of cholangiocarcinoma. Thank you, Dr. Kamel. I, I was gonna ask Dr. Washington um, a question. So, Dr. Washington, you know, you you, you mentioned um, you know different risk factors um, for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I was wondering if you could comment just a little bit more on like, is there any role for screening in high risk populations? Um, and then also wanted to just ask you a little bit if you could comment on, you know, um, maybe the the, the different um, phenotypes and genotypes of cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, based on the etiology of the disease, whether it be kind of like sporadic or associated with hepatolithiasis or, you know, um, liver flukes or anything like that. It, you know, is there some heterogeneity and um, how we should think about cholangiocarcinoma geographically or based on etiology? Sure. Um, I think to answer your first question about uh, screening, obviously, uh, like I mentioned, most of the patients who are being quote, screened are, are usually being screened because there's a concern for HCC. Um, since we don't have really great data on um, what specific disease processes increase your risk of developing um, ICC specifically, we tend to screen patients and we tend to, um, we tend to uh, surveil, I guess, patients who have risk factors for HCC, like your cirrhotics and um, those who have um, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and that sort of thing. So that's one of the benefits of doing more population-based studies that specifically focus on intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma because then it will allow us to um, identify those factors that we can create a subset of patients that are at a higher risk um, of developing intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma that may or may not be related to um, their 
um, a diagnosis of cirrhosis um, or that sort of thing. And of course, you, like I mentioned before, the cholidopal cyst patients, the um, PSC patients, those are, we know those as high, high risk. And so those patients are being monitored once mm -hmm. they're diagnosed with those highly inflammatory uh, type biliary diseases. Uh, but other factors, like I mentioned, such as uh, diabetes or, um, or obesity, those things are still kind of a question because obesity is so prevalent, particularly in the United States. It's hard to, to pull the patients out that are at the highest risk in order to surveil them. And of course, cost becomes an issue, um, which is a huge thing here in the United States as far as surveillance and, um, and, and preventative measures. Is that we have to look at the things that are going to give us really the most bang for our buck. Um, and so identifying those patient groups that are at highest risk are very, very important. Um, and that's the reason why these epidemiologic studies are so necessary. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Um, I have a question for Dr. Oh, uh, Professor uh, Amadori. Yeah, to please. To, to the talk of uh, Kimberly. I mean, I appreciate very much that you mentioned tobacco. I mean, smoke as a risk factor, right? I, I, did I get the message? I think this is one of the first uh, papers I read that and I think it's very important. You know, you would ask, how does it happen? How, how does tobacco influence development of, of, of even cholangiocarcinoma? It may, may be important for your team, if you have patients who smoke, then tell them to stop it. Uh, even if after you have operated them, you know? Because they some kind of uh, growth factors may, may be induced by smoking, right? Can it be? So the yeah, next, I think, I think with tobacco, the the thing about it is we don't outside of lung cancer. I don't think we really know the pathophysiology that causes the development of any cancer in relation to smoking. But for whatever reason, patients who who have a chronic history of smoking are at risk of every malignancy. There's, there's very few where it's not um, in some way correlated. Now, and is that because um, tobacco use is also associated with other things that are at higher risk? I don't know. Um, but this is, again, the reason why these sorts of studies are so important um, because we need to flesh out what is it about tobacco that makes you at a higher risk of developing all types of, um, of malignancies. And intrahepatic angiocarcinoma is not unlike the rest. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had a question for uh, Dr. Kamel. Uh, Dr. Kong, I have a question for you also. If, if you're able to turn your camera on, I'll ask it um, after I ask Dr. Kamel. So uh, Ehab, I was just going to ask you, you talked a lot about, you know, assessing response, and we're going to hear from um, Samik a little bit later, and also from Boss about, you know, systemic therapy, local regional therapy. You know, is there any role for, you know, CT in that area, or, you know, you largely highlighted MR, and I was wondering, you know, we, we frequently have this um, discussion, especially from a global perspective about use of CT versus MR, um, kind of institutional dependent um, and provider dependent. I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit more around CT versus MRI for primary diagnosis, but then also, I think more importantly, as we're beginning to use more systemic and local regional therapies, you know, what's your kind of uh, your take on that? Uh, great question, and oftentimes we struggle with that. Uh, certainly, CT continues to be a lot more available than MR, and uh, fewer contraindications, uh, especially in elderly population, if they have a device, if they have a pacemaker, and so forth. Um, and, and it definitely is a longer study. But uh, on the other hand, um, MR uh, has made significant advantages in having faster acquisitions wide wider bore and also the contrast agents now are safer than before even in patients with impaired kidney function so there are pros and cons certainly ct continues to be the primary modality i think that there are innovations in both ct and mr but uh, and these in the ct world include dual energy for example uh, 
but the criteria for assessing response continue to be lagging behind. In other words, your conventional criteria are still based on tumor size or maybe tumor enhancement to make it simplistic. The challenge with that is that you end up using very expensive chemotherapeutic or uh, local regional therapy or maybe immunotherapy, and you're still using very simplistic approach mm -hmm. to assessing response. Uh, I can make a very strong argument that we're underestimating or under, you know, we're poorly quantifying response uh, using these conventional metrics. And that was the motivation to look for function, meaning can we look at the entire tumor volume rather than one axial measurement? Can we look at uh, morphologic changes, including the apparent diffusion coefficient, which is what I alluded to, or tumor enhancement? Can we assess in that tumor volume the amount of enhancing tissue? One of the things that I was amazed that we reached the same conclusion is that tumor burden is a huge metric that would determine survival, even without doing anything else. And it makes sense. But to date, we don't do that routinely. You think of all the advancement in imaging technology and tumor segmentation, with one click, you can get liver volume. And with auto segmentation of the different tumors, you can get a percent hepatic involvement. And that in itself is a huge uh, metric that can predict survival. So tumor volume is very important and decrease in enhancement is very important and changes at a cellular level. And oftentimes, as I was alluded to, it's not gonna be one metric. It's a multi-parametric approach, meaning sure. a small tumor that was viable. Otherwise, if the tumor is large and already necrotic, it is extremely unlikely for any therapy to be effective on an already necrotic tumor. So this is a very, I'm, I'm very ex excited about the fact that you brought this up. Uh, I also want to be respectful of our time because I know that we're approaching yeah. the break. I can talk for another hour about tumor response, but you know, <laughs> I don't want to take too I much. I appreciate it. We, we know you're a world expert on that topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamel. Um, I did want to, you know, uh, Dr. Kong, are you there? I was going to ask you one question if you are, if not. Yeah, Dr. Rachari has a, has a question. Sameek. Hey, I was going <clears> to <throat> just add something uh, to the concept of uh, tumor burden, um, probably for both, you know, locally advanced disease and, and metastatic disease. There, there, there's another measurement that we're starting to, to see and utilize with liquid biopsy. Mm -hmm. So looking at cell-free DNA and fractions, uh, there was a, a, a nice paper in, in JCO Precision Oncology uh, uh, with uh, Matesh Barad, um, as the first author was uh, Dr. Junior, where they looked at the the, the dominant clone of, of of their patient's disease and looked at the the cell fraction. Uh, not even you know what what mutation it was. It didn't matter. It was just whatever the dominant mutation was, um, and that fraction in the blood. Uh, it, we know it correlates with total body disease. So the more disease you have, the more tumor DNA you're going to have uh, uh, in, in your in your plasma, um, and they were able to stratify several groups. Um, so, so being able to uh, measure tumor burden radiographically, but also through blood, uh, will be interesting to see how that becomes a, a clinical tool uh, for for both prognostication and and you know to be determined how it could be helpful for prediction. Uh, but uh, very interesting topic. Yeah, great point, and a point that has broad applicability um, well, well beyond uh, cholangiocarcinoma, and it'll be a very interesting tool in the future. What, one brief question for Dr. Kong, and then we'll, we'll break for five minutes. Dr. Kong, I know you talked about in your in your presentation about kind of, if I understood properly, like risk stratifying patients based on immunohistochemical staining and certain markers. Um, and I was wondering if you are clinically using that information to inform treatment at all. Um, so in other words, if someone had a specific pattern, immunohistochemical pattern, uh, would that, uh, you know, be information be used in your multidisciplinary setting with your medical oncologist to perhaps inform, you know, adjuvant therapy? Does that question make sense? Uh, 
uh, uh, you mean uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, biomarkers are used for uh, diagnosis or treatment? Yeah, for treatment, if you're using some of the, the data you presented to actually inform treatment, you know, it sounds like you're using it to risk stratify patients, but then are you taking that information and saying, aha, now we're going to maybe change the way we're managing someone based at a, on that information? Where um, the, 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 we recommended uh, uh, immunohistochemical panels uh, just for the ICC subtype classification. And if we uh, uh, to make a, a, a decision to uh, the, the drug targeted therapy, uh, we should do the, uh, some uh, special genes uh, mutation uh, detection. So, uh, uh, immunohistochemical markers are usually uh, used for uh, ICC subtype classification and the molecular alterations uh, are used for uh, drug targeted uh, therapy uh, like uh, IDH1 yeah. or 2 or FGFR2. At, yeah. At, uh, yeah, that's extremely helpful. And that actually, I think, is a perfect segue into our next talk.